guest, our guest speaker tonight, is, you know, this afternoon, is John Fadden. He's the Visitor Service Manager at the Wadsworth Longfellow Home in Portland, and he's going to speak to us about the poet and scholar Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And I think we may have gotten you out of sequence slightly there, John. That's quite all right. All right. <laughs> That's probably my fault, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> well, good afternoon, folks. My name is John Babin, and I'm going to be speaking today about the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And as I speak this afternoon, I'm going to be reading from the book, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, The Fireside Poet of Maine, okay? And this is about his life in Portland, and it's also about the history of Portland the way it was when Henry was living here. Um, so I'll be reading from this book. This is one that I did author. Um, and I'm going to be doing a little slide presentation. Then after we get done, um, I can take questions. We can talk about Henry. And, you know, so just let me know if you have questions during the um, presentation. Go right ahead. That's great. So I do work at the Maine Historical Society. The first um, slide that was up there showed the campus. Um, these are the grounds here of the Longfellow House. You can see students out front. And then, of course, the beautiful gardens out back. I'll be talking a little bit about the property um, as we go along. But we're going to start here. Um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in Portland, the fireside poet of Maine. This is his birthplace. Um, he was born down on 4th Street um, in Portland. Um, if you know anything about the history of Portland, back uh, when Henry was growing up, 4th Street was where the water came up to, okay? So this house was looking right out onto the harbor, and this is where he was born. This house is no longer there. The residence inn is there, okay? So this big residence inn is there, but if you uh, go to the front of the residence inn, there is a rock on the ground with a plaque that commemorates um, where Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was born. His parents were Stephen and Zilpa Longfellow. They had a total of eight children, so Henry had seven brothers and sisters growing up in Portland. And this is the Portland Observatory. Now, Henry was born in 1807, and as I said, I'll be talking a little bit about Portland history along with um, Henry's life, but when Henry was born in 1807, Portland faced a very difficult problem. And the problem was, that the ships that were coming into the harbor, coming around Portland Head, out by where the Portland Headlight is, the folks in the town did not know when the ships were arriving. They did not know what ships were arriving. And so they did not have the means to be ready when a ship came into the harbor to have the docks um, ready with people to unload the ships, to reserve dock space. So Lemuel Moody was a local sea captain, and Lemuel Moody came up with the idea of building an observatory on top of Monjoy Hill. This observatory actually looked right out onto the harbor, and with binoculars he could see all the way out to Portland Head, okay, where the headlight was. So he would see the ships coming around Portland Head. And what he did was he would identify the ships by the flags. So he had a signaling that he used, and then they would know when to get these docks ready and people ready to unload the ship. So it was a really ingenious idea. And also, down the street from, of course, the Portland Headlight is the home where Henry grew up. And this is the home originally built by Peleg Wadsworth. Peleg was Henry's grandfather, and Peleg was a Revolutionary War general. Peleg served with General George Washington. And when General George Washington died, it was Peleg's daughter who made a request to her father that he would ask Martha Washington for something from the late president's funeral. Martha Washington actually cut a locket of George Washington's hair off and presented it to Pele to give to his daughter, which is still in the Longfellow house today. So Henry was only five years old when the War of 1812 happened. The War of 1812 really didn't affect the city at all. It really didn't come to Maine except for one battle. And this was the battle 
between the boxer and the British ship, the Enterprise. In this battle, both captains of the boxer and the Enterprise were killed. And after the ships were towed back into Portland Harbor, the city decided to give these two captains a full military funeral, both the American and the British captain, okay? Now this was a very big event in Portland, and even though Henry was only five years old, Henry remembered seeing this funeral march march down to the Eastern Cemetery. So Henry in later years would write about the War of 1812, and I'm going to read a little bit from the book. I have all my bookmarks in place with numbers on them so I know exactly where to go and read from. And so he talks about remembering this typical event. And he said, I remember the sea fight far away, how it thundered o'er the tide and the dead captains as they lay in their graves or looking the tranquil bay where in battle they died. And the sound of that mournful song goes through me with a thrill. A boy's will is the wind's will and thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. So this is what Henry remembers is the gravestones and the burial of the dead captains of the Enterprise. Now, I'm a, I'm a guide at the Longfellow House. I manage the house. Um, I make sure that everything is taken care of. And I, talk, I give tours and I talk about the poet. I've written about the poet. Um, this is the way that most people remember the poet. Isn't this the way you remember the poet with the long hair and the long beard? Okay. Well, this is the way I remember the poet, okay? Because I'm the person that gives tours of his home when he was a boy growing up there. And this is Henry um, at eight years old, okay? And Henry had a great life growing up here at the home, seven brothers and sisters. His father was a lawyer, but he was also a congressman. And um, very, very loving and nurturing parents. So. He learned a lot about the history of the city through his father. And he remembers Deering Woods. Now, you all know what Deering Oaks are, okay? When Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was growing up in Portland, he lived in this home on Congress Street. Well, Congress Street looked right out onto the harbor, which was just two blocks away, okay? Also, if you're standing in front of the house and you went over to the right side of the home, that was all woods, and that was called Deering Woods, all the way down to where Deering Oaks is, okay? If you looked on the left side of the home, you could look all the way up, and you could see the observatory. From the back of the house, it was an acre and a half farm back there. Can imagine, this is built back in 1786, an acre and a half farm that went all the way down to Back Bay. And they said, that they could see all the way out to Mount Washington. So imagine when this house was built by Pele, they're wondering why he's building this home way in the back of the town, which was only two blocks away from the harbor, but it was an old dirt road back then, okay? And it was just one of a few scattered farms that were actually built there. So Henry remembers Deering Woods, and he writes about Deering Woods in later years, and he writes, In Deering Woods, our affection fair, and with joy that is almost pain, my heart goes back there. And among the dreams of days that were, I find my lost youth again, in the strange and beautiful song that grows in repeating still, a boy's will is the wind's will, and thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. Now I've read two passages from this poem, and the reason why I do is because this poem, if you ever read just one poem of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's, read My Lost Youth. Because it's Henry, the older poet, coming back to Portland and remembering his thoughts, okay, of youth. So 
you know, it, it really talks about um, the city and the way that he remembered it. Now, Henry, when he, the home was originally built, it was two stories. And this is the way the poet remembered it with three stories. And I talked about how the home looked right out onto the harbor. Well, from the third floor where Henry's bedroom was, he could see all the way out to the Portland headline. Okay? So imagine looking out, looking out over the harbor and seeing the Portland headlight. And Henry writes about the Portland headlight sitting up in his room and many years later and in looking out and he says, the rocky ledge runs far into the sea and on its outer point some miles away, the lighthouse lifts its massive masonry, a pillar of fire by night, a cloud by day. And even at this distance, I can see the tides upheaving break unheard along its base, a speechless wrath that rises and subsides. So imagine a young Henry Wadsworth Longfellow looking out his bedroom window and seeing all the way up to Portland Harbor. So we think about Henry as a child growing up here in this home, looking right out onto the harbor. And this is a poem that he wrote it's my favorite, um, and I put it in the book. And it's a poem called Musings. And it's Henry sitting in his room at night, looking out onto the harbor, as you can see here. I sat by my window one night and watched how the stars grew high. And the earth and skies were a splendid sight to a sober and musing eye. From heaven the silver moon shone down with gentle and mellow ray and beneath the crowded roofs of the town in broad light and shadow lay. A glory was on the silent sea and mainlands and islands too, till a haze came over that lowland lay and shrouded that beautiful blue. So think about Henry growing up as a child, um, looking right up onto the harbor from his home. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was 13 years old when he wrote his first published poem called The Battle of Lovell's Pond. And The Battle of Lovell's Pond story is a great one. It's a story that his grandfather used to share with him about a battle that took place back in 1725 between the Native Americans and the New Settlers. Okay, And Henry remembered this story that his grandfather told him and he decided that he was going to write a poem about this event. Well, the story was that Henry wrote the poem and he didn't tell anyone but one family member, and that was his sister Anne. And I'm going to talk about Anne a little bit later in the presentation. So Henry writes his poem, The Battle of Lovell's Pond. He tells only his sister, and he signs the poem only Henry. He takes the poem, he folds it up, he puts it in his pocket, he goes out for a stroll, ends up in front of the Portland Gazette, the local newspaper, and takes the poem out and drops it in their mail slot. He goes back and he tells Anne what he did. So Ian and Henry, in anticipation, waiting, is the poem going to be published? Is the poem going to be published? And a day goes by, two days go by. Three days go by and they open up the paper and what do they see? The Battle of Lovell's Pond by Henry. <laughs> now, Henry's pretty excited. His first poem is published in the newspaper, okay? Henry is visiting a friend's house that night and he overhears the friend's father talking with another gentleman. You know what they're talking about? The poem, exactly right. It's stiff, it's borrowed. Nothing but borrowed, the gentleman says to the other one. Henry hears this, and he, he's totally upset, and he gets out of there as quick as he can. He doesn't let on that he's the poet. He just gets out of there when he goes home, and he tells, Ian, he tells Sister Ian what happened. So Sister Ian decided, well, we're gonna fix this once and for all. She takes the poem up to the mother, the mother reads it, gives it to the father, and they said, it's not that bad. So as you can see, it didn't, it didn't hurt Henry to get that much rejection for his first poem. 
that was published when he was only 13 years old. So Henry Wadsworth Longfellow graduated the Portland Academy, which was the local private high school. And he was accepted to Bowdoin College when he was 14 years old. Okay? So being that young, Henry's parents thought college life is going to be way too much for a 14-year-old. And so they made arrangements that the Portland Academy would actually take the studies from Bowdoin College and they would teach Henry down at, at the Portland Academy for his first year of college, okay? And then he would go up for his second, third, and fourth, and he would graduate at the age of 18 years old. He graduates at the age of 18 years old and is offered a professorship at Bowdoin College to become their first professor of modern languages. If Henry will travel to Europe in study foreign languages. Now, a little story that most people don't know about Henry, even though Henry had a great life with his seven brothers and sisters and a loving mother, Aunt Lucia living in the home, and his father who was a congressman and, and a lawyer, there was always a little bit of a battle, and it was going on between Henry and his dad. Henry wanted to be a full-time writer, and his father said, son, you become a full-time writer, you work for a newspaper, you'll go from newspaper to newspaper to newspaper, you'll never have a family, you'll never get married, you'll never have any money. He wanted his son to go into law. Henry's response, I don't like to argue. <laughs> he said that maybe medicine could be your calling. And Henry said, I don't like the sign of blood. So, so this is a battle that goes on, and we have records of letters going back and forth, and Henry writing to his father, you know, and asking him, you know, what is going to become of me, you know, if, if you want me to study law, and I don't like law. So this battle goes back and forth, but now Bowdoin College offers Henry Wadsworth Longfellow a teaching position if he'll go to Europe and study foreign languages at his own expense. <laughs> so... Henry's father believes this is a great idea. He will pay for the trip. He will send Henry over to Europe. Henry will learn how to speak foreign languages. He will come back and become a professor, and he can also be a writer. It's the best of both worlds. Of course, Henry accepts, okay? And he goes off to study foreign languages in Europe. So this is where he stayed when he was at Bowdoin College, when he went out for his second year. This is his tuition bill, and I, I, I love the tuition bill if you look at it. Okay, $14.25 for one semester at Bowdoin College. Okay. I, I, I kind of think it might be a little bit different today. It might, might just be just a little bit higher, I'm not sure. Okay. And of course, his five beta kappa keys. Um, so you, you think about him graduating at 18 and going off to Europe. Graduates in the class of 1825, very famous class. Uh, a lot of well-known people um, attended Bowdoin in that class. And now Henry would go off to Europe and he would study foreign languages. Henry would learn how to speak German, Italian, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. He would stay almost three years in Europe, and he would come back to become the professor of modern languages at Bowdoin College. So this is Henry at 22 years of age. He also becomes a professor at Harvard, okay? And he would retire from teaching in 1854 to become a full-time writer. This is where he lived when he was teaching at Harvard, down at the Craigie House. This is now known as Longfellow House Washington Headquarters, okay? And the reason why his home has that title is because when this home was originally built, it was originally used by George Washington, okay, during the Revolutionary War, while well, he was in Boston. And when Henry Wadsworth Longfellow went to teach at Harvard, 
he was able to rent the same two rooms that Washington used during the Revolutionary War. And Henry absolutely loved this. I mean, he wrote to his, his friends and talked about how he was in the two rooms, you know, that General George Washington, you know, had, had planned battles. And George Washington was a very, very important figure to the Longfellow children. It was their grandfather who served and was very, very close friends with George Washington. And if you go into the Longfellow house today, the home that I manage in Portland, there's a portrait, um, an engraving of George Washington. And it's up over the fireplace mantle, okay? This particular engraving of George Washington has been hanging up over that mantle since 1802, okay? That is a place of honor for George Washington. <laughs> so this is, this is a big deal for Henry to be staying in the same two rooms as George Washington when he's teaching down at Harvard. So we see Henry, a young poet, not the beard and the long hair yet. And then we see his sister, Anne. Now his sister, Anne, is a very, very important person to us at the Longfellow House because it's Anne who left the home to the Maine Historical Society, okay? And so Anne actually lived in the home until she was 90 years old. She was the last remaining Longfellow child to live in the house. And she died in the home in 1901, 90 years old. But prior to her death, she got together with the Maine Historical Society. And she said, I will leave you the home in all its contents if you turn the home into a museum in honor of not only my brother, the famous poet, who wrote some of his most famous poems in the home, where he grew up, but it was my father, who was a congressman for the state of Maine, when Maine became a state in 1820. And it was the father, Stephen Longfellow, that was one of the signers of the Constitution for the state of Maine. He was also the founder of the Maine Historical Society back in 1822, along with other local businessmen, making it the third oldest historical society in the country. Okay? And when Anne died, she asked that a building be built on the grounds of her home to house a library for the Maine Historical Society. Okay? Now, Anne left eight pages of instructions, okay, on how things were to be carried out, okay? And so I'm going to just read just a little bit of the eight pages of instructions, but it says, Father's chair to be left in the room with the table in the center of the room. The armchair by the window to be left in the room in its place under the window. The little four-legged table is to be left in the corner of the room. The sideboard and the bookcase are to remain under the arch. The portrait of Washington always to be hung where it has always hung over the mantle. The painting of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow to remain opposite the wall and the portrait of father displayed where it is now. And she says, if the family doesn't want it, I am want the engraving of Evangeline, the first one ever made after the poem was written, to remain on the wall. And I love how she puts in I am. In other words, Evangeline's not moving. Okay? You know, so you think about Anne and eight pages of instructions left. And if you come to the home and, and, and you take a tour of the home, sometimes I, 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 if I have a very small group, I'll kind of get into the eight pages of instructions. And if people are interested, I'll show them some of the things that, that Anne said. Certain things are never to be touched. Certain things are never to be moved. I think certain stories are never to be told. <laughs> I, I thought about that when I wrote this book. Um, and some things I didn't tell. And even though I found out a lot of great information about the family. Um, so, you know, you think about Anne, like the engraving of George Washington. And then there's some windows on the side of the house that used to look out to Deering Woods. 
And I talked about the beautiful views that they had of the water and looking up towards the observatory and looking out back and seeing all the way up to Mount Washington and looking over and seeing the <coughs> woods. Well, as the town grew, the town grew from the waterfront and it moved up towards the Longfellow House. So now we don't see the water anymore. Next door to the Longfellow House where they could look all the way up and see City Hall and look all the way up and see the observatory, a hotel on it. The back land of the home um, was farmland, but over the years, parts of it were taken by eminent domain by the city so they could build housing for folks and streets. And so now the Longfellow House is surrounded on three sides by the city. And Anne was a Sunday school teacher. And she taught down at the First Parish Church, right down the street from the home, the one built in 1825. And she was coming home one afternoon and noticed they were digging a foundation over in Deering Woods, right next to her home. Anne walked into the home, and she ordered that the family members that were living in the home at that time close all the shutters on all of the windows inside and outside of the home and lock them. Never to be opened again because Anne was not about to look upon the hideous building that was being built next door. Okay? So so people say when they come into the house and they say, you know, nobody's ever opened those those shutters. We said, no, we painted them, but we never opened them. And if we did open them, we wouldn't see the hideous building anyway. Because before the building was built, Anne had the windows on that side of the home bricked up. <laughs> so, I'm working on a book about Anne right now, just so you know. Okay, she, she really, she's a hero. She is. I mean, leaving this beautiful home and all its contents to the main historical society to become a museum, having the foresight to have a library built on the grounds of the Maine Historical Society, so the Maine Historical Society would have a permanent home, okay? So that's a story about the Longfellow House and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's life in Portland. Um, I'd like to just read a few things um, from the book, okay? Henry was known as the Fireside Poet of Maine. And I just want to read a little bit about the Fireside Poets. The Fireside Poets was a group of poets who used a similar method of writing, time, and it included William Cullen Bryant, James Russell Lowell, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., John Greenleaf Whittier, and of course, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. These poets used the practice of standard forms, regular meter, and rhyme stanzas, making the poetry easy to memorize and recite. These American poets were popular abroad as well as in America, <clears throat> rivaling that of the British poets, who were also accepted by American and the British public. The subjects were simple at times, and it made the poetry a form of entertainment for families gathered around a warm and cozy fire. So it was the normal person, the normal layman, you know, worker that could actually you know, read these poems to their family. And, and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow becoming a very, very famous poet, you know, in, in his later years, um, always tried to keep his poetry very simple, very understandable for the common man. And it was people like Edgar Allan Poe who didn't like Longfellow at all because it wasn't dark, it wasn't deep, okay? It was, it was poetry that could be understood by the working man. Okay, and read to the family. So I'm going to end with a poem. And this is a poem that he wrote in the home. And it's, it's probably one of his saddest poems. Um, and it is called The Rainy Day. And the day, is, the day is cold and dark and dreary. It rains and the wind is never weary. The vine still clings to the moldering wall. But at every gust the dead leaves fall. And the day is dark and dreary. My life is cold and dark and dreary. It rains and the wind is never weary. My thoughts still cling to the moldering past. But the hopes of youth fall thick in the blast and the days are dark and dreary. 
Be still, sad heart, and cease repining. Behind the clouds is the sun still shining. The fate is the common fate of all. Into each life some rain must fall. Some days must be dark and dreary. Now, I am not going to end this poem, this talk on a bad note like that, okay? I read this poem because it was written in the home, and it was one of the many, many pieces that he worked on or wrote in the home um, here in Portland, Maine. But I want to kind of tell a funny story. The book has a very, very happy ending, okay? Just so you know, all right? And, and I, I, when the book first came out, I got my first piece of fan mail. It was from a gentleman up in Union, Maine. And he wrote to me and he said, I like your book. He said, yes, sir. He said, it's good. It has a good, happy ending. He said, I live up on an apple orchard. And it's kind of lonely up here. And he said, and I got your book and I sat by my pot belly stove. He said, with a nice hot cup of tea. And I read it. This was my first fan letter. <laughs> from a guy in Union, Maine, sitting next to a pot belly stove, okay? Just come in and had come out in the fall, so he had just finished doing his harvest, you know, so it was getting cold, it was October, you know, and he was reading my book. So I, I kind of like it because he said it ended with a happy ending, and it does have a happy ending. The sad thing today is, I usually end the talk by saying, and if anybody would like to buy a copy of the book, we're offering it for 10% off today, and I would be more than happy to sign it for you and personalize the book if you'd like to buy a copy. I can't say that today. I don't have any books. <laughs> Boo hoo, poor me. I have a best selling book and I can't even get copies of it because all the books in the store at the Maine Historical Society sold out and yesterday sold the last copy. We had ordered a boatload of them so we could have them for Sunday so I could bring a box here and I could sell them to you. Publisher didn't get them out in time. No. So anyway, if you're interested in the book called Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in Portland, there's little business cards right up there, and on the back of it, it tells you how you can buy it through the museum store. And if you buy the book through the museum store, and go buy it at Amazon or and buy it locally, when you order the book, you can request, please have John sign it, personalize it, whatever you want. You can tell me what you'd like written in the book. So if you're interested in buying the book um, online, you can do that, grab the cards. Also, there's free bookmarks up there from my publisher and also from the Maine Historical Society. Um, questions, folks? Sure. Um, you said he was one of eight children. Where was he in the, in the sequence? Number two. He had an older yes. brother, Stephen. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yes. Where are Henry's parents buried? In town somewhere? Um, actually, there was um, a tomb um, up in the, the cemetery on the west end, and it actually um, was empty. And we think that the bodies were brought up to the Hiram farm where the grandfather lived. Yeah, because there's a tomb, but it's empty. Yeah, yeah. But then, from what we understand, it was empty by the family. It wasn't the the, the remains were stolen. Sure. What ages then did he live in Portland? So he was born in 1807, moved into the home on Congress Street when he's just about a month old. He remained at the house until he started to teach at Bowdoin College. Um, but he, this was still the home base. And I always say the house was the home base until he left to go teach at Harvard. Okay. Yeah. Yes, where did he write the Wreck of the Hespers? Um, there were three different locations where he really enjoyed writing, okay? When he was in Maine, it was usually at the house, okay? He really got a lot of, um, a, a lot of good, good feelings from the home, a lot of inspiration um, at the home, and a lot of inspiration from the city, too. And said that's why he loved to return. 
um, to write, but he also had a summer home in Nahan, and he also had the home in Cambridge. So those are the three really basic locations that, that he wrote a lot of his poetry and worked on a lot of his poetry. Though we do know in the earlier years when he was still living in Portland and when he was teaching at Harvard, sometimes he would return to Portland in another place that he liked to write. You know where the Marine Hospital is? Okay? Yeah, he used to, that was, there was a hotel there called the Veranda. And he used to love to go to the Veranda and sit out by the water and write. We know he finished with Angelina out there. Yeah, out by the Marine Hospital. Sure. Do you know if he wrote when he was visiting his grandfather in Highland? Yeah, they, 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 we don't have anything, but we do know that, you know, he would visit his grandfather in Hiram, and he would also visit his grandfather in um, Gorham, Maine, okay? And he was young at the time, okay? Usually it was in the summertime, so we know that he worked on a lot of things. He probably worked on the Battle of Lovell's Pond uh, at his grandfather's, you know, but... Um, you know, when he was young, he was he was writing a lot, but um, you know, a lot of that never got published. A lot of it got destroyed. You know, it was in later years that um, that Henry really discovered that he was starting to become famous. Um, he wrote to Anne, and he said to Anne, he said, "Don't give away anything." He said, "I want you to preserve everything." The reason why he wrote to her and said, don't give anything away, is because people were asking him for his autograph, you know, sign this, sign that, sign that, and they were selling his autograph. So, so as he became famous, he was aware that people were trying to make money off him, and they were going to probably go after his poor sister and try to get whatever they could from her. Okay, so he made sure early on that she preserved everything and didn't give nothing away. And I think that's probably where you know, preserving that house to that point came from, you know, and basically preserved everything. I mean, we're talking original furnishings, original china, original knickknacks, you know, original paintings. I mean, it's amazing. Oldest piece in the home dates back to around 1760, and the newest piece of furnishing in the home actually is called the new table. <laughs> Want to take a guess when the new table arrived at the home? 1835. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Sure. At the house, there was a shop that the general ran. Yeah. Do you know when that was? Built? Okay. So, the general built the home back in 1786. It actually started in 1785. Okay. The bricks for the home came from Philadelphia. Okay, they ran out of brick. Okay, so they had to get more brick from Philadelphia in order to finish the home. The home was finished, but while the home was being built, there was a wooden shop that was built. Helen was staying up on the second floor, and he had a store, and he bought it a lot of the stuff in the store for wood and building materials for his home. The reason why they ran out of brick is because the bricklayers that built his home, this was the first brick home built in Portland, okay? And it's the oldest house on the peninsula. Well, when you go into the house, you have the front, back, and two side walls, okay? They all have window seats in front of all the windows. And the reason why is the brick masons built the walls six brick deep, okay? So imagine, imagine how thick those walls are. They're the, basically the only load-bearing walls in the home are the front, back, um, and side walls. But yeah, he did, so, so from, the store was there before 1786, and the store was basically turned down, torn down in the early 1800s. Sure. Would you tell us something about his, uh Married life, his family? Sure. His Henry was married twice. First time he was married to a local girl named Mary Potter, okay? And she died of a miscarriage while they were traveling in Europe while he was studying foreign languages before teaching at Harvard. So she died. Um, his second wife was Frances Appleton. They had five children together. And um, 
They lived down at the, the Craigie home, the home that where um, he stayed as a child, grow, um, as a student when he was going to Harvard. And when he married Frances Appleton, her father was a very wealthy man, bought that Craigie house as a wedding gift. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Is that where you wrote the children's hall? Yes, it is. Exactly right. Yep. I think he designed a garden at the Craigie House. Do you know anything about that? There are, the, land, the landscaping is absolutely beautiful um, down there. And um, Henry, don't really know that much about if he took after his mother and sister Anne, but they were both avid gardeners and had a beautiful garden, an herb garden, out in back of the home plus all the farmland. So, I mean, you know, he was used to growing up with a beautiful garden, you know, and that land is absolutely, that landscaping is absolutely beautiful there. Yeah. Sure. How about the other six siblings? Um, no fame. Um, <laughs> basically, no yeah, no, no fame. Um, Alexander was an architect, okay? His older brother Stephen died um, very young. He was an alcoholic. Um, the brother Samuel, okay, um, he was he was a, a writer and did a biography of his brother Henry. Yeah. But but they they never really they never really <coughs> followed in the brother's footsteps. But one thing about the family that you should know, um, both the boys and the girls got an equal education, okay? The father and the mother of um, Stephen and Zilpa felt as though education was very, very important to the, all of the Longfellow children. And Anne, believe it or not, in doing the research for the new book, I just discovered that she actually studied law in her father's law office. And that was highly unlikely in the 1800s for ladies to study law, okay? Sure, any others? Well, thanks so much, and like I said, you know, grab a card, go online, I'll go to the Isaac Bowling, and you buy it online. Thanks so much for having me, it was a blast. Thanks a lot.